My name is Darren Petrucci. Uh, I'm an architect and urban designer. Started out in college as pre-med um, at Tulane University. And uh, in the end of my first semester, I was doing well, but I wasn't loving it. Uh, and uh, I walked outside on a Sunday morning and there was a big uh, event, I thought, going on down in the courtyard uh, of the dormitory that I was living in. And when I got down, when I got downstairs and walked outside, uh, I looked up and there was a student naked standing on the seventh floor of the dorm. Uh, they we had these ledges on these dorms and there were no railings and he was screaming it was judgment day. And there was maybe 30 people down below and everyone was really concerned because he didn't look like he was in his right mind and he dove off the uh, ledge and and killed himself and um, and so everyone was very shaken up and what what at Tulane what they did is they in the dorms they would organize the dorms based on your major and so all the architecture students were on the top on the seventh floor that was the top floor of the building so after a few weeks went by and everything kind of settled down I went up to the seventh floor to see like what's going on up there and when I walked into one of the dorm rooms, uh, I saw these models and drawings and, and, uh, and renderings and things. And I just thought, wow, I could do that. Like you can go to college and I had no idea. I don't have any architects in the family. Um, uh, my mother did some design work a little bit like, you know, minimal things when she was younger. Um, and I was heavily into art in high school, art and science. And so when I realized that this was a profession, uh, I immediately called my parents and said, uh, listen, I don't want to, I don't want to be a doctor. Much to my father's chagrin, he, I think, really wanted me to be a doctor. I think he wanted me to be a doctor more than I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, but my mother said, you know, do what you love and the rest will come. And so um, I switched majors. I switched schools. Uh, we, I came to ASU. I did my undergraduate degree in architecture at ASU. And then uh, had a very successful, I think, undergraduate career, and then uh, went on to Harvard's Graduate School of Design for my uh, master's degrees. I have a master's degree in architecture, and I also have a master's degree in urban design. So uh, that's kind of how I got to be where I am today, um, and have never looked back, and it's been a great, a great path so far. Okay. It's awesome. I didn't yeah. know about this. Yeah, I know. It's crazy, Suicide. right? Suicide, yeah. It's yeah. shocking. Yeah, it was shocking to me too. But in some ways, I've never, I may have never discovered architecture mm, had I not. Yeah. 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 Alright. Um, can you tell us the name of your company and what you do as part of your work with the company? Sure. Uh, I have a very small practice. It's me. Uh, it's called Architecture Infrastructure Research. Uh, and um, the name is really, uh, I think, uh, a description of what I do. I'm interested in architecture. I'm interested very much in infrastructure and specifically the urban realm, but also infrastructure as it relates to architecture. So what are the things that facilitate the use of the, of the buildings and of the city and how do we as designers design those? And often those are not designed by architects or, or by designers, They're usually just done by engineers. And then the research component of it is, is, a, is a relationship to my academic uh, uh, position and my interest in research. And so with the projects that I do, I really work hard to try to uh, bring advanced research methods to looking at the problem at hand. And in that uh, redefinition of the problem through the research, uh, come up with unique solutions. And specifically, I'm interested in hot, dry climates. Uh, and um, I like to say hotter, drier, smarter. But uh, that's, that's where AIR, and I like the acronym of AIR because uh, you can't live without AIR. So the idea is that uh, the firm is multivalent. Um, I collaborate with a lot of people, even though I'm the you know, sole principal of it. Um, my firm is a little bit alternative in the sense that I network uh, my resources. And so that's a really nice way to work. Can you also talk about your academic position? Because you have essentially two jobs. I do. Uh, so uh, I'm a professor in the design school in the Herbert Institute for Design and the Arts. Um, I teach in the architecture program. Uh, I teach the graduate level in architecture. Uh, and I also uh, coordinate the urban design program at ASU. And uh, I teach an urban design studio. And we're reshaping that urban design program right now. A city like Phoenix, it's a great place to be an urban designer because it's a relatively new and young city. 
and um, it's an incredible laboratory uh, given the climate and the context. So uh, it's an exciting place to be an urban designer. Uh, so can, can you tell us about a, a project, a specific house that you've designed, and yeah. a story as well? So the house I'll share with you is um, the smallest house I've done, it's actually next to the smallest house I've done, uh, for a friend and a colleague, uh, Heidi Fisher. Uh, it's in uh, Portal, Arizona, which is near the border between Arizona and Mexico. And it is part of, uh, it's at the base of what are known of as the Sky Islands, which are these remarkable mountaintops that have incredible uh, uh, ecological conditions and species, etc. And so we, um, we started the project, actually Heidi wanted to buy a double wide trailer, and uh, we had dinner one night and I told Heidi that uh, I wasn't going to let her buy a double wide trailer because uh, I could not see her living in a double wide in this incredible landscape. So um, she described to me that while the landscape is incredibly beautiful, it's actually undergoing this, uh, this pause uh, in its uh, metamorphosis due to the fact that there's invasive species uh, and this invasive mesquite actually that's taking over part of the landscape. And that while it looks quite beautiful, it's actually uh, a very negative situation happening in the landscape. And so we talked about this idea of what she calls the diapause, uh, or what, what is termed as a diapause, could we develop a house that perhaps could give back to the landscape, that its insertion in the landscape might better the landscape, as opposed to most architecture, when you insert it into a landscape, it becomes a, a negative condition, uh, an obstruction, if you will, or, uh, or something that becomes detritus eventually in the landscape. So that was the point of departure for the project, and that was kind of our brief. Could we do, could we do this thing? And it had to be small. She had a limited budget, and it's also a place where, um, while the landscape is quite amazing, there's security issues and other things with people crossing the border. Uh, and she's a single woman living alone in this house, and it's a second home for her. But nevertheless, uh, those are issues that I was concerned about as well. So we got in the car. We drove four hours to Portal. I'd never been there before, and um, about. Uh, we had, we started arriving, it was getting dark, and just before we came over this uh, uh, edge uh, and down into the valley where Portal is, uh, she said, look, let's pull over, and we got out, we looked up at the night sky, and it was, this is an image that, that you took, actually, uh, when you were there, um, but uh, it was like this, it was this incredible image of the night sky, and, and you realize at that point why she's interested in Portal, Arizona, even though it's out in the middle of nowhere. And so, um, thinking about this image, we talked a lot about um, the program and could we have ways for her to experience this at night and, and could the house make a safe place for her to do that? And other types of things that you realize is when you look at the view of uh, the Chiricahuas where her, uh, these are the Sky Islands where her house is located, and this is actually a view from the roof deck of the house, but this was the view that um, we positioned the house down this valley. It's very interesting because in this landscape, as the cool air is formed at the top of the mountains, as it begins to come down the valley, it begins to accelerate. You get these incredible breezes that move through, uh, down between these alluvial fans uh, into the valley. So we position the house very strategically to capture those breezes. She didn't want any air conditioning. She didn't want any heat. So uh, it's solar and it's got a well, so it's completely off the grid. Uh, she's, she's a very... Um, fortified person in the sense that she can withstand uh, temperatures and she's still comfortable. Uh, but we try to make the house as environmentally conscious as possible and, and really try to respond to those forces of the environment uh, as best we could, harness them as best we could. So the middle of the house, uh, this is a quick image, the middle of the house is really like a porch and I can explain this uh, in some models and drawings. But the, um, the center of the valley here where it comes down the air comes and moves through the house, and up inside here are these two windows up high that I call the nostrils, uh, because she can open them from the inside, and those nostrils on either side allow the breeze to move through the house without the wind coming through the house, and so it's a way of naturally ventilating the house without disturbing papers or things that are inside, because the breeze can be quite substantial. Uh, and the roof line of the house is also designed, it's a butterfly roof, and it was initially designed to capture all the rainwater and collect it in some large cisterns. We haven't built the cisterns yet, but it's set up for that. And so the idea that 
those cisterns could collect water, and that water could then be used to repair some of the landscape around the house, and ideally plant things, which we're not quite there yet, but ideally plant things that might uh, respond to the invasive uh, mesquite population that's coming through. The idea of the inside of the house is that it's really a porch. She, she had communicated in our brief that she wanted to spend most of the time on a porch, but because her budget was so tight, we couldn't build a house and a porch. So my design strategy was, let's make the entire house the porch. So the idea was to create these two flanking uh, programs that are the kind of private programs of the house, and then in the center of those, in that space, make a porch with big doors that can open and screens so that when you're inside, you really feel like you're outside. And uh, this was an image that you took as one of my favorite images at night, where you can really just see the kind of night sky darkness and this uh, one moment of habitation. And what I love so much about this image is the rest of the house just kind of goes away and you just see this almost like LED screen of someone uh, living in the landscape. So that's the basic idea of the house. And maybe I can show you in a model and some drawings, you know, the, the general form and shape and how things work if you're interested in that. One of the things that looks remarkable about the house is also the, the view that you get yes. from inside the house. Um, if you don't mind pointing out to the sure. nostrils and also the sky deck. Yeah, so um, the way we orchestrated this glass, in the, in the initial design, I had huge glass sliding doors in here that we couldn't afford to do. So we had to go with a less expensive window system. So what, we, what I did was I designed these giant picture windows at the top that really frame the mountain view uh, and the height of the mountains. And then this structural piece that comes through with the operable down below is really about the foreground landscape. So you get the high background and the foreground, you try to collapse those into this one composition. This is the nostril up at the top, and what she can do is she can, she can actually reach up or step on a stepping stool, open those nostrils here, there's one on the other side and on this side of the house, and when the breezes come down the mountain, they, they shoot through the nostrils and they accelerate because there's a venturi effect that that's occurs when the wind hits the face of this and then gets sucked through these uh, smaller nostrils. And if you don't mind going back to the first image, and, because that's taken from the sky deck. Yeah. So this is the roof deck, the sky deck, as you say, and this is part of the program where she can climb up over the carport and has a roof deck that's completely secure. And when you're, if you have a bed up there, you could sleep up there at night as a sleeping, a sleeping loft, an outdoor sleeping deck, uh, and no one can see you because the walls come up around it. So it's a very secure prospect. It, it's both that retreat and prospect at the same time. And what you're seeing here is the edge of the butterfly roof kind of uh, carrying your eye up and to the, to the mountain ranges. Fantastic. One last thing maybe too that might be interesting is that the floor of the house is a black concrete. Uh, it's a black integrated colored concrete. And the idea behind that is in the winter time, when the sun is at a low angle, it'll penetrate deeply into the house, heat that floor up and use the floor like a natural uh, heat brick, if you will, in the house. Okay. Let me show you, I can show you maybe with a computer model. Um, so yeah, and as you, as you show this model, if you don't mind talking about uh, the beauty, its utility, and its sustainability. I mean, you, you yeah, yeah. mentioned some of these yeah. um, along the way, but... So, so the, uh, the, the idea behind the house was, can we make something where everything's fully integrated into the design? And so, really, nothing in the house is uh, extraneous. Everything had to be part of the design. So, for example, the proportions uh, of the side walls that have the bedrooms and the carport and the, and the sleeping deck, that proportion is equal to half of the distance of this upper area. And there are large sliding screens that are not yet on that are going to be installed soon that sit in these areas that come and close up the house. And those screens, there are sun protection in the summertime and there's security for the house when she's not there or even when she's there at night. So the idea is that the form and shape of the house, the butterfly roof that catches the rainwater, uh, the angle of the roof, which is adjusted to the, ang the optimal angle of the solar panels, which are attached to that south-facing uh, facade. And in this case, the, um, if I can rotate this around, here you can begin to see the roof deck that sits up above, which is accessed from down below under the carport. So in many ways, the house is like a product in the sense that all the ingredients are fully integrated into the object. Um, but the object, even though it's an object in the landscape, it's really a vessel for looking at the landscape. So for me, the interesting intellectual idea of the house is that 
When you approach it, you see it as an object sitting in the landscape, but once you're inside it, the house goes away and the landscape becomes the focal point. And that's, I think, an important aspect of the house. It's beautiful. Yeah. And so on this side, you can begin to see the carport. And again, the screens, this is, this is a one version of the screen that will pull across uh, that facade. And so all of the glass, everything's protected and the house is secure. Okay, so um, if you don't mind walking us through some of your drawings and the model, that would be wonderful. Well, in architecture, what we all, often try to do is make sure that we approach the project from as many different viewpoints as possible. So uh, we'll begin with sketches and photographs of the site and then move to uh, a kind of computer model where we begin, as I showed before, to 3D uh, uh, build the project. Uh, and then, and this is maybe a crude version, and then there's usually a physical model that we'll build to one, explain to the client, the contractor, but also a way of testing out the idea. So this is an earlier model of the project. There was uh, the, the uh, cisterns that were located on either side. We were ramping the earth up to the edges of it. Here you see the sky deck, uh, the solar panels, the butterfly roof, and how that water would collect here and move down into the cisterns. Um, the, as I mentioned before, the inside of the house is really a big porch. There's really just a landscape that moves down. The mountain sits up here. Uh, the breezes come down, the views in the two directions. And then these two masses really block the difficult east and west elevations. So the partee of the house is incredibly simple. It's just two bars with a void in between. The void is where the daily life happens and the two bars are where the sleeping uh, and uh, storage occur. These are some of the construction documents for the house. This is kind of the last phase of representation that we go through. Uh, a site plan, uh, electrical plan, the window elevations, the physical building elevations, and then uh, the roof and some of the details. So this is a sense of the kind of drawings that we give to the contractor to actually go out and build the house. One of the interesting challenges with this house is we had a 70 plus year old contractor who had never built a modern house before. Uh, and given the distance that we were from the project, I couldn't be there very much to make sure that uh, things were built properly. And he did a phenomenal job building the project, but I think um, having the model and the drawings and the computer model were very helpful in communicating the idea. The siding on the house is a, is a concrete cement board and he mitered the corners. I asked him to miter the corners as a wrap. It's a very inexpensive material, but when you detail it in a certain way where things are very precise, that, that normal and ordinary material becomes extraordinary. And that, that's really, um, when you're dealing with low cost projects, it requires a high level of design work to try to make those projects, uh, let's say, greater than the sum of all the individual decisions that you're making. And, and frankly, to, to create beauty in the project. And hopefully, you know, with this kind of work, it's environmentally responsive, but it's also beautiful at the same time. And it's, it's got economy, it's cost effective. And that's the sweet spot. If you can integrate all of those things, beauty comes from that integration uh, of understanding the proportions and the site and the landscape and combining that with the systems of the house and combining that with the budget, then if all of those pieces are in concert, uh, then you have something you can't really add anything or take anything away from and you know you're done. What would you recommend to a student, a young student who yeah. might want to become an architect? Well, I think the most important thing about the design disciplines in general, and I wouldn't say this specifically about architecture only, is that I often say to students that, you know, there are jobs, I work at the McDonald's, and then there are careers, I'm a lawyer, and then there are lifestyles. And I really think that design is a lifestyle. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, designers often marry other designers. Um, designers eat, sleep, drink, think about the work they're doing all the time. Uh, because design is the marriage of technology and science and art and culture uh, in the human condition, uh, and now the environment and the ecological and biomimetic and all these other things that we're looking at, uh, it's really something that is so um, pervasive in our everyday lives that when that's an interest of yours, it becomes your whole world. And it's an amazing world. It's an amazing world to live in. It's an amazing world to see. It's an amazing way to see the world. And so I think that the most important thing is that you have to love it because 
you know, I can tell you that when I switched from pre-med to architecture, I would sit down and, and I, even to this day, I'll sit down in the morning and start drawing and six hours will go by and I'll think a half an hour has gone by. And that's when I know I'm in the right discipline. That's when I know I'm doing the right thing. When time just collapses and I'm completely invested in what I'm doing. And so I would say to any young designer, uh, really think deeply about how much you enjoy doing what you do. And then also, more importantly, look out at the rest of the world and realize it's all design. Everything is. And if you can see the world that way, I think uh, you'll be a very happy person and you'll be successful in whatever you do. Thank you, Darren. That was fantastic. Thanks for Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.